Anne Rutledge from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Liu Out of me unworthy and unknown The vibrations of deathless music With malice toward none With charity for all Out of me the forgiveness of millions toward millions And the beneficent face of a nation Shining with justice and truth I am Anne Rutledge Who sleep beneath these weeds Beloved in life of Abraham Lincoln Wedded to him Not through union But through separation Bloom forever O Republic From the dust of my bosom End of poem This recording is in the public domain Hamlet McCure from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas October 4, 2006 In a lingering fever many visions come to you. I was in the little house again, with its great yard of clover, running down to the board fence, shadowed by the oak tree, where we children had our swing. Yet the little house was a manor hall set in a lawn, and by the lawn was the sea. I was in the room where little Paul strangled from diphtheria. But yet it was not this room. It was a sunny veranda, enclosed with mullioned windows. And in a chair sat a man in a dark cloak, with a face like Euripides. He had come to visit me, or I had gone to visit him, I could not tell. We could hear the beat of the sea, the clover nodded under a summer wind, and little Paul came with clover blossoms to the window and smiled. Then I said, What is divine despair, Alfred? Have you read tears, idle tears? he asked. Yes, but you do not there express divine despair. My poor friend, he answered, that was why the despair was divine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mabel Osborne from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Laura Fox of ShiningHalf.com. Your red blossoms amid green leaves Are drooping, beautiful geranium, But you do not ask for water, You cannot speak, You do not need to speak, Everyone knows that you are dying of thirst, Yet they do not bring water, They pass on, saying, The geranium wants water. And I, who had happiness to share, and longed to share your happiness, I who loved you, Spoon River, And craved your love, Withered before your eyes, Spoon River, Thirsting, thirsting, Voiceless, from chasteness of soul, To ask you for love, You who knew and saw me perish before you, Like this geranium, which someone has planted over me and left to die. Recorded May 4, 2006. This recording is in the public domain. Number 203. William H. Herndon. From the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Sean McGahey. December twenty ninth, two 2006 There, by the window in the old house, perched on the bluff, overlooking miles of valley, my days of labor closed, sitting out life's decline. Day by day did I look in my memory, as one who gazes in an enchantress's crystal globe, and I saw the figures of the past, as if in a pageant glassed by a shining dream, move through the incredible sphere of time. 
and I saw a man arise from the soil like a fabled giant and throw himself over a deathless destiny. Master of great armies, head of the republic, bringing together into a dithram of recreative song the epic hopes of a people. At the same time Vulcan of sovereign fires, where imperishable shields and swords were beaten out from spirits tempered in heaven. Look in the crystal. See how he hastens on to the place where his path comes up to the path of a child of Plutarch and Shakespeare. O oh, Lincoln, actor indeed, playing well your part, and Booth, who strode in a mimic play within the play. Often and often I saw you, as the cawing crows winged their way to the wood over my housetop at solemn sunsets, there by my window, alone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. 204. Rebecca Wasson from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Caitlin Sticko, 2006. Spring and summer, fall and winter and spring, after each other drifting, past my window drifting. And I lay so many years watching them drift and counting the years till a terror came into my heart at times with the feeling that I had become eternal. At last my hundredth year was reached, and still I lay hearing the tick of the clock and the low of the cattle and the scream of a jay flying through falling leaves. Day after day alone in a room of the house of a daughter-in-law stricken with age and grey. And by night, or looking out of the window by day, my thoughts ran back, it seemed, through infinite time, to North Carolina, and all my girlhood days, and John, my John, away to the war with the British, and all the children, the deaths, and all the sorrows, and that stretch of years like a prairie in Illinois, through which great figures passed like hurrying horsemen, Washington, Jefferson, Jackson, Webster, Clay. O oh, beautiful young republic for whom my John and I gave all our strength and love, and O oh, my John! Why, when I lay so helpless in bed for years, praying for you to come, was your coming delayed, seeing that with a cry of rapture, like that I uttered when you found me in old Virginia after the war, I cried when I beheld you there by the bed, as the sun stood low in the west, growing smaller and fainter in the light of your face. End of Poem this recording is in the public domain. Rutherford McDowell from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas October twentieth, two 2006 They brought me ambrotypes of the old pioneers to enlarge, and sometimes one sat for me, Someone who was in being when the giant hands from the womb of the world tore the republic. What was it in their eyes? For I could never fathom that mystical pathos of drooped eyelids and the serene sorrow of their eyes. It was like a pool of water amid oak trees at the edge of a forest where the leaves fall as you hear the crow of a cock from a far-off farmhouse, seen near the hills where the third generation lives, and the strong men and the strong women are gone and forgotten. And these grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the pioneers, truly did my camera record their faces, too, with so much of the old strength gone and the old faith gone and the old mastery of life gone, and the old courage gone, which labors and loves 
and suffers and sings under the sun. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hannah Armstrong from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Laura Fox of ShiningHalf.com I wrote him a letter asking him, for old time's sake, to discharge my sick boy from the army, but maybe he couldn't read it. Then I went to town and had James Garber, who wrote beautifully, write him a letter, but maybe that was lost in the mails. So I traveled all the way to Washington. I was more than an hour finding the White House, and when I found it they turned me away, hiding their smiles. Then I thought, oh, well, he ain't the same as when I boarded him, and he and my husband worked together, and all of us called him Abe there in Menard. As a last attempt, I turned to a guard and said, Please say it's old Aunt Hannah Armstrong from Illinois. Come to see him about her sick boy in the army. Well, just in a moment they let me in, and when he saw me he broke in a laugh and dropped his business as president and wrote in his own hand Doug's discharge, talking the while of the early days and telling stories. Recorded May 3rd, 2006. This recording is in the public domain. Lucinda Matlock from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters I went to the dances at Chandlerville and played snap-out at Winchester. One time we changed partners, driving home in the moonlight of middle June, and then I found Davis. We were married and lived together for seventy years, enjoying, working, raising the twelve children, eight of whom we lost ere I had reached the age of sixty. I spun, I wove, I kept the house, I nursed the sick, I made the garden, and for holiday rambled over the fields where sang the larks, and by Spoon River gathering many a shell, and many a flower and medicinal weed, shouting to the wooded hills, singing to the green valleys. At ninety-six I had lived enough, that is all, and passed to a sweet repose. What is this I hear of sorrow and weariness, anger, discontent, and drooping hopes? Degenerate sons and daughters, Life is too strong for you. It takes life to love life. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Davis Matlock from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Greg Ahi. October 6, 2006 in Anchorage, Alaska. Suppose it is nothing but the hive, that there are drones and workers and queens, and nothing but storing honey, material things, as well as culture and wisdom for the next generation. This generation never living, except as it swarms in the sunlight of youth, strengthening its wings on what has been gathered and tasting, on the way to the hive from the clover field, the delicate spoil. Suppose all this, and suppose the truth, that the nature of man is greater than nature's need in the hive, and you must bear the burden of life as well as the urge from your spirit's excess. Well, I say to live it out like a god sure of a mortal life, though you are in doubt is the way to live it. If that doesn't make God proud of you, then God is nothing but gravitation, or sleep is the golden goal. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Herman Altman from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters, read for LibriVox.org by Matthew O'Meara on 10-19-2006. Did I follow truth wherever she led, and stand against the whole world for a cause, and uphold the weak against the strong? If I did, I would be remembered among men, 
as I was known in life among the people, and as I was hated and loved on earth. Therefore build no monument to me, and carve no bust for me, lest, though I become not a demigod, the reality of my soul be lost, so that thieves and liars, who were my enemies and destroyed me, and the children of thieves and liars, may claim me and affirm me before my bust, that they stood with me in the days of my defeat. Build me no monument, lest my memory be perverted to the uses of lying and oppression. My lovers and their children must not be dispossessed of me. I would be the untarnished possession forever of those for whom I lived. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Jenny McGrew from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Annie Coleman Not where the stairway turns in the dark, a hooded figure, shriveled under a flowing cloak. Not yellow eyes in the room at night, staring out from a surface of cobweb gray. And not the flap of a condor wing, when the roar of life in your ears begins, as a sound heard never before. But... On a sunny afternoon, by a country road, Where purple ragweeds bloom along a struggling fence, And the field is gleaned and the air is still, To see against the sunlight something black, Like a blot with an iris rim, That is the sign to eyes of second sight, And that I saw. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Columbus Cheney from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas. October 7, 2006. This weeping willow, why do you not plant a few for the millions of children not yet born, as well as for us? Are they not non existent? or cells asleep without mind? Or do they come to earth, their birth rupturing the memory of previous being? Answer. The field of unexplored intuition is yours. But in any case, why not plant willows for them, as well as for us? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Poem 212, Wallace Ferguson, from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters, read for LibriVox.org by Frank Farage. There at Geneva, where Mont Blanc floated above the wine-hued lake like a cloud, when a breeze was blown out of an empty sky of blue, and the roaring Rhone hurried under the bridge through chasms of rock, and the music along the cafes was part of the splendor of dancing water under a torrent of light. And the purer part of the genius of Jean Rousseau was the silent music of all we saw or heard. There at Geneva, I say, was the rapture less because I could not link myself with the eye of yore when twenty years before I wandered about Spoon River, nor remember what I was, nor what I felt, we live in the hour, all free of the hours gone by. Therefore, O oh soul, if you lose yourself in death and wake in some Geneva by some Mont Blanc, what do you care if you know not yourself as the you who lived and loved in a little corner of earth known as Spoon River, ages and ages vanished? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Marie Bateson from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Joyce Nussbaum, Highland Park, New Jersey You observe the carven hand with the index finger pointing heavenward. That is the direction, no doubt, but how shall one follow it? 
It is well to abstain from murder and lust, to forgive, do good to others, worship God without graven images. But these are external means, after all, by which you chiefly do good to yourself. The inner kernel is freedom. It is light, purity. I can no more find the goal or lose it, according to your vision. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Poem number 214, Tennessee Claughlin Shope, from the Spoon River Anthology, by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org, by Rob Howard, Knoxville, Tennessee. www.robsellsknoxville.com I was the laughing stock of the village, chiefly of the people of good sense, as they call themselves, also of the learned, like Reverend Pete, who read Greek the same as English. For instead of talking free trade, or preaching some form of baptism, Instead of believing in the efficacy of walking cracks, picking up pins the right way, seeing a new moon over the right shoulder, or curing rheumatism with blue glass, I asserted the sovereignty of my own soul. Before Mary Baker G. Eddy even got started with what she called science, I had mastered the Bhagavad Gita and cured my soul. Before Mary began to cure bodies with souls. Peace to all worlds. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Plymouth Rock Joe From Spoon River Anthology By Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org By Betsy Bush Marquette, Michigan June 2006 Why are you running so fast hither and thither, Chasing midges or butterflies? Some of you are standing solemnly scratching for grubs. Some of you are waiting for corn to be scattered. This is life, is it? Cock-a-doodle-doo! Very well, Thomas Rhodes. You are cock of the walk, no doubt. But here comes Elliot Hawkins. Gluck, gluck, gluck! Attracting political followers. Qua, qua, qua! Why so political, Minerva, this gray morning? Kitty, qua, qua, for shame. Lucius Atherton, the raucous squawk you evoke from the throat of Anner Clute, will be taken up later by Mrs. Benjamin Pantier as a cry of votes for women. Caduc, duke. What inspiration has come to you, Margaret Fuller Slack? And why does your gooseberry eye flit so liquidly, Tennessee Claflin Shope? Are you trying to fathom the esotericism of an egg? Your voice is very metallic this morning, Hortense Robbins, almost like a guinea hen's. Qua! That was a guttural sigh, Isaiah Beethoven. Did you see the shadow of the hawk, or did you step upon the drumsticks which the cook threw out this morning? Be chivalric, heroic, or aspiring metaphysical, religious, or rebellious. You shall never get out of the barnyard, except by way of over the fence, mixed with potato peelings and such, into the trough. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Emmanuel Ehrenhart from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Aaron Decker I began with Sir William Hamilton's lectures, then studied Dugald Stewart, and then John Locke on the understanding, and then Descartes, Fichte, and Schelling, Kant, and then Schopenhauer. Books I borrowed from old Judge Somers all read with rapturous industry, hoping it was reserved to me to grasp the tale of the ultimate secret and drag it out of its hole. My soul flew up ten thousand miles, and only the moon looked a little bigger. Then I fell back, how glad of the earth, all through the soul of William Jones, who showed me a letter of John Muir. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Samuel Gardner from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Yearsley I, who kept the greenhouse, lover of trees and flowers, oft in life saw this umbrageous elm measuring its generous branches with my eye, and listened to its rejoicing leaves, lovingly patting each other with sweet aeolian whispers, and well they might, for the roots had grown so wide and deep that the soil of the hill could not withhold aught of its virtue, enriched by rain and warmed by the sun, but yielded it all to the thrifty roots, through which it was drawn and whirled to the trunk, and thence to the branches and into the leaves, wherefrom the breeze took life and sang. Now I, an under-tenant of the earth, can see that the branches of a tree spread no wider than its roots, and how shall the soul of a man be larger than the life he has lived? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Tao Crit from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Liu. Samuel is forever talking of his elm, but I did not need to die to learn about roots. I, who dug all the ditches about Spoon River, look at my elm, sprung from as good a seed as his, sown at the same time. It is dying at the top, not from lack of life nor fungus, nor destroying insect, as a sexton thinks. Look, Samuel, where the roots have struck rock, and can no further spread, and all the while the top of the tree is tiring itself out, and dying, trying to grow. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. William Jones from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas September 9, 2006 Once in a while a curious weed unknown to me, needing a name from my books. Once in a while a letter from Yeomans. Out of the mussel shells gathered along the shore, sometimes a pearl, with a glint like meadow rue. Then betimes a letter from Tyndall in England, stamped with the stamp of Spoon River. I, lover of nature, beloved for my love of her, held such converse afar with the great who knew her better than I. Oh, there is neither lesser nor greater, save as we make her greater, and win from her keener delight. With shells from the river, cover me, cover me. I lived in wonder, worshipping earth and heaven. I have passed on the march eternal of endless life. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Two hundred twenty. William Good from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Sean McGahey. December twenty ninth, two 2006 To all in the village I seemed, no doubt, to go this way and that way aimlessly. But here by the river you can see at twilight the soft-winged bat fly zigzag here and there. They must fly so to catch their food. And if you've ever lost your way at night in the deep wood near Miller's Ford and dodged this way and now that, wherever the light of the Milky Way shone through, trying to find the path, you should understand I sought the way with earnest zeal, and all my wanderings were wanderings in the quest. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. 
J. Milton Miles from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Corrie Samuel J. Milton Miles Whenever the Presbyterian bell was rung by itself, I knew it as the Presbyterian bell. But when its sound was mingled, with the sound of the Methodist, the Christian, the Baptist, and the Congregational, I could no longer distinguish it, nor any one from the others, or either of them. And as many voices called to me in life, marvel not that I could not tell the true from the false, nor even, at last, the voice that I should have known. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Faith Matheny from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Joyce Nussbaum, Highland Park, New Jersey At first you will know not what they mean, and you may never know, and we may never tell you, these sudden flashes in your soul like lambent lightning on snowy clouds at midnight when the moon is full. They come in solitude, or perhaps you sit with your friend and all at once a silence falls on speech and his eyes without a flicker glow at you. You two have seen the secret together. He sees it in you and you in him. And there you sit, thrilling, lest the mystery stand before you and strike you dead with a splendor like the sun's. Be brave, all souls who have such visions. As your body's alive, as mine is dead, you're catching a little whiff of the ether reserved for God himself. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Shoalfield Huxley from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Bordelon God, ask me not to record your wonders. I admit the stars and the suns and the countless worlds, but I have measured their distances and weighed them and discovered their substances. I have devised wings for the air, and keels for water, and horses of iron for the earth. I have lengthened the vision you gave me a million times, and the hearing you gave me a million times. I have leaped over space with speech, and taken fire for light out of the air. I have built great cities and bored through the hills, and bridged majestic waters. I have written the Iliad and Hamlet, and I have explored your mysteries, and searched for you without ceasing, and found you again after losing you in hours of weariness. And I ask you, how would you like to create a sun, and the next day have the worms slipping in and out between your fingers. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Willie Medcalf from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Greg Ahi September 28, 2006 in Anchorage, Alaska. I was Willie Medcalf. They used to call me Dr. Myers because they said I looked like him. And he was my father, according to Jack McGuire. I lived in the livery stable, sleeping on the floor side by side with Roger Bauman's bulldog, or sometimes in a stall. I could crawl between the legs of the wildest horses without getting kicked. We knew each other. On spring days I tramped through the country to get the feeling, which I sometimes lost, that I was not a separate thing from the earth. 
I used to lose myself as if in sleep by lying with eyes half open in the woods. Sometimes I talked with animals, even toads and snakes, anything that had an eye to look into. Once I saw a stone in the sunshine trying to turn into jelly. In April days in this cemetery the dead people gathered all about me and grew still like a congregation in silent prayer. I never knew whether I was a part of the earth with flowers growing in me or whether I walked. Now I know. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Willie Pennington from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Leah Bratman. They called me the weakling, the simpleton, for my brothers were strong and beautiful, while I, the last child of parents who had aged, inherited only their residue of power. But they, my brothers, were eaten up in the fury of the flesh which I had not, made pulp in the activity of the senses which I had not, hardened by the growth of the lusts which I had not, though making names and riches for themselves. Then I, the weak one, the simpleton, resting in a little corner of life, saw a vision, and through me many saw the vision, not knowing it was through me. Thus a tree sprang from me, a mustard seed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Village Atheist from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org Ye young debaters over the doctrine of the soul's immortality, I, who lie here, was the village atheist, talkative, contentious, versed in the arguments of the infidels. But through a long sickness, coughing myself to death, I read the Upanishads and the poetry of Jesus, and they lighted a torch of hope and intuition and desire, which the shadow, leading me swiftly through the caves of darkness, could not extinguish. Listen to me, ye who live in the senses, and think through the senses only. Immortality is not a gift. Immortality is an achievement, and only those who strive mightily shall possess it. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. John Ballard from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Eve Leaf www.rateyourwriting.com In the lust of my strength I cursed God, but He paid no attention to me. I might as well have cursed the stars. In my last sickness I was in agony, but I was resolute, and I cursed God for my suffering. Still, he paid no attention to me. He left me alone, as he had always done. I might as well have cursed the Presbyterian steeple. Then, as I grew weaker, a terror came over me. Perhaps I had alienated God by cursing him. One day Lydia Humphrey brought me a bouquet, and it occurred to me to try to make friends with God. So I tried to make friends with him, but I may as well have tried to make friends with the bouquet. Now— I was very close to the secret, for I really could make friends with the bouquet by holding close to me the love in me for the bouquet. And so I was creeping upon the secret, but... End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Julian Scott from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Samantha Hayes Toward the last, the truth of others was untruth to me, the justice of others injustice to me. Their reasons for death, reasons with me, for life. Their reasons for life, reasons with me, for death. I would have killed those they saved, and saved those they killed, and I saw how a God, if brought to earth, must act out what he saw and thought, 
and could not live in this world of men and act among them side by side without continual clashes the dust for crawling the heavens for flying wherefore o soul whose wings are grown soar upward to the sun end of poem this recording is in the public domain Alfonso Churchill from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters, read for LibriVox.org by Greg Ahi, October 6, 2006, in Anchorage, Alaska. They laughed at me as Prof. Moon, as a boy in Spoon River, born with a thirst of knowing about the stars. They jeered when I spoke of the lunar mountains and the thrilling heat and cold and the ebon valleys by silver peaks and spica quadrillions of miles away and the littleness of man. But now that my grave is honored, friends, let it not be because I taught the lore of the stars in Knox College, but rather for this, that through the stars I preach the greatness of man, who is none the less a part of the scheme of things for the distance of spica or the spiral nebula, nor any the less a part of the question of what the drama means. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Zilpha Marsh from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Laura Fox of ShiningHalf.com at four o'clock in late October, I sat alone in the country schoolhouse, back from the road mid stricken fields, and an eddy of wind blew leaves on the pane, and crooned in the flue of the cannon stove, with its open door blurring the shadows with the spectral glow of a dying fire. In an idle mood I was running the planchet, all at once my wrist grew limp, and my hand moved rapidly over the board till the name of Charles Guiteau was spelled, who threatened to materialize before me. I rose and fled from the room bareheaded into the dusk, afraid of my gift. And after that the spirits swarmed. Chaucer, Caesar, Poe, and Marlowe, Cleopatra, and Mrs. Surratt, wherever I went with messages. Mere trifling twaddle, Spoon River agreed. You talk nonsense to children, don't you? And suppose I see what you never saw, and never heard of, and have no word for. I must talk nonsense when you ask me what it is I see. Recorded May 23, 2006. This recording is in the public domain. James Garber from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas November 1, 2006 Do you remember, passerby, the path I wore across the lot where now stands the opera house, hasting with swift feet to work through many years? Take its meaning to heart. You too may walk, after the hills at Miller's Ford seem no longer far away. Long after you see them near at hand, beyond four miles of meadow. And after woman's love is silent, saying no more, I will save you. And after the faces of friends and kindred become as faded photographs, pitifully silent, sad for the look which means, we cannot help you. And after you no longer reproach mankind with being in league against your soul's uplifted hands, themselves compelled at midnight and at noon to watch with steadfast eye their destinies. After you have these understandings, think of me and of my path, who walked therein and knew that neither man nor woman, neither toil nor duty, gold nor power, can ease the longing of the soul, the loneliness of the soul. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lydia Humphrey from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Annie Coleman Back and forth, back and forth, to and from the church, with my Bible under my arm till I was gray and old, unwedded, alone in the world, finding brothers and sisters in the congregation, and children in the church. I know they laughed and thought me queer. I knew of the eagle souls that flew high in the sunlight, above the spire of the church, and laughed at the church, disdaining me, not seeing me. But if the high air was sweet to them, sweet was the church to me. It was the vision, vision, vision of the poets, democratized. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Number 233. Leroy Goldman. From the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Sean McGahey. December 29, 2006. What will you do when you come to die? If all your life long you have rejected Jesus and know as you lie here... He is not your friend. Over and over I said, I, the revivalist. Ah, yes, but there are friends and friends. And blessed are you, say I, who know all now, you who have lost, ere you passed, a father or mother, or old grandfather or mother, some beautiful soul that lived life strongly and knew you all through and loved you ever. Who would not fail to speak for you and give God an intimate view of your soul as only one of your flesh could do it? That is the hand your hand will reach for to lead you along the corridor to the court where you are a stranger. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Locon, strugglingwordguy.blogspot.com Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Poem 234 234 Gustav Richter After a long day of work in my hot houses, sleep was sweet. But if you sleep on your left side, your dreams may be abruptly ended. I was among my flowers when someone seemed to be raising them on trial, as if it after a while to be transplanted to a larger garden of freer air. And I was a disembodied vision, a middle light, as it were the sun, had floated in and touched the roof of glass, like a toy balloon, and softly bursted, and etherealized in golden air. And all was silence, except the splendor, was imminent and th with thought as clear. As a speaking voice, and I, as thought, could hear a presence think as he walked, between the boxes pinching off leaves, looking for bugs and noting values, with an eye that saw it all. Homer, oh yes, Pericles, good, Caesar, Bagoria, what shall be done with it? Dante, too much manure, perhaps. Napoleon, leave him a while as yet. Shelley, more soil. Shakespeare, needs spring. Clouds, eh? End number 234. Arlo Will, from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas, October 10th, 2006. Did you ever see an alligator come up to the air from the mud, staring blindly under the full glare of noon? Have you seen the stabled horses at night tremble and start back at the sight of a lantern? Have you ever walked in darkness 
when an unknown door was opened before you, and you stood, it seemed, in the light of a thousand candles of delicate wax. Have you walked with the wind in your ears, and the sunlight about you, and found it suddenly shine with an inner splendor? Out of the mud many times, before many doors of light, through many fields of splendor, where around your steps a soundless glory scatters like new-fallen snow, will you go through earth, O strong of soul, and through unnumbered heavens to the final flame. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Captain Orlando Killian from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Deb Bacon Ziegler in Lansing, Michigan Oh, you young radicals and dreamers, you dauntless fledglings who pass by my headstone, mock not its record of my captaincy in the army and my faith in God. They are not denials of each other. Go by reverently, and read with sober care how a great people, riding with defiant shouts the centaur of revolution, spurred and whipped to frenzy, shook with terror, seeing the mist of the sea over the precipice they were nearing, and fell from his back in precipitate awe to celebrate the feast of the Supreme Being. Moved by the same sense of vast reality of life and death, and burdened as they were with the fate of a race, how was I, a little blasphemer, caught in the drift of a nation's unloosened flood, to remain a blasphemer and a captain in the army. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Jeremy Carlyle from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Kirk Thomas, November 2nd, 2006. Passer by, sin beyond any sin is the sin of blindness of souls to other souls. And joy beyond any joy is the joy of having the good in you seen, and seeing the good at the miraculous moment. Here I confess to a lofty scorn and an acrid skepticism. But do you remember the liquid that Pennywit poured on tin types, making them blue with a mist like hickory smoke? Then how the picture began to clear till the face came forth like life? So you appeared to me, neglected ones, and enemies too, as I went along with my face growing clearer to you as yours grew clearer to me. We were ready then to walk together, and sing in chorus and chant the dawn of life that is holy life. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Joseph Dixon from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Eveleaf, www.rateyourwriting.com Who carved this shattered harp on my stone? I died to you, no doubt. But how many harps and pianos wired I, and tightened and disentangled for you, making them sweet again, with tuning fork or without? Oh, well, a harp leaps out of the ear of a man, you say? But whence the ear that orders the lengths of the strings to a magic of numbers flying before your thought through a door that closes against your breathless wonder? Is there no ear round the ear of a man that it senses through strings and columns of air the soul of sound? I thrill as I call it a tuning fork that catches the waves of mingled music and light from afar. The antenna of thought that listens through utmost space. Surely the concord that ruled my spirit is proof of an ear that tuned me, able to tune me over 
and use me again if I am worthy to use. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Judson Stoddard from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox by Greg Ahi, September 28, 2006, in Anchorage, Alaska. On a mountain top above the clouds that stream like a sea below me, I said that peak is the thought of Buddha, and that one is the prayer of Jesus, and this one is the dream of Plato, and that one there the song of Dante, and this is Kant, and this is Newton, and this is Milton, and this is Shakespeare, and this the hope of the Mother Church, and this, why, all these peaks are poems, poems and prayers that pierce the clouds, and I said, what does God do with mountains that rise almost to heaven? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Russell Kincaid from Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Betsy Bush Marquette, Michigan, June 2006 in the last spring I ever knew, in those last days, I sat in the forsaken orchard, where beyond fields of greenery shimmered the hills at Miller's Ford, just to muse on the apple tree, with its ruined trunk and blasted branches, and shoots of green whose delicate blossoms were sprinkled over the skeleton tangle, never to grow in fruit. And there was I with my spirit girded, by the flesh half dead, the senses numb, yet thinking of youth, and the earth in youth, such phantom blossoms palely shining over the lifeless boughs of time. O oh, earth that leaves us ere heaven takes us, had I been only a tree to shiver with dreams of spring and a leafy youth, then I had fallen in the cyclone which swept me out of the soul's suspense, where it's neither earth nor heaven. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Aaron Hatfield From Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Aaron Decker Better than granite, Spoon River, is the memory picture you keep of me standing before the pioneer men and women there at Concord Church on Communion Day, speaking in broken voice of the peasant youth of Galilee who went to the city and was killed by bankers and lawyers, my voice mingling with the June wind that blew over wheat fields from Atterbury, while the white stones in the burying ground around the church shimmered in the summer sun. And there, though my own memories were too great to bear, were you, O oh pioneers, with bowed heads, breathing forth your sorrow for the sons killed in battle, and the daughters and little children who vanished in life's morning, or at the intolerable hour of noon. But in those moments of tragic silence, when the wine and bread were passed, came the reconciliation for us, us, the plowmen and the hewers of wood, us, the peasants, brothers of the peasant of Galilee. To us came the comforter and the consolation of tongues of flame. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cleve Gray. Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Isaiah Beethoven. They told me I had three months to live. So I crept to Bernadotte and sat by the mill for hours and hours where the gathered waters, deeply moving, seemed not to move. Oh, world, that's you. 
You are but a widened place in the river, where life looks down and we rejoice for her, mirrored in us. And so we dream and turn away. But when again we look for the face, behold the lowlands and blasted cottonwood trees where we empty into the larger stream. But here by the mill the castled clouds mock themselves in the dizzy water. And over its agate floor at night, the flame of the moon ran under my eyes amid a forest stillness broken by a flute in a hut on the hill. At last, when I came to lie in bed, weak and in pain, with the dreams about me, the soul of the river had entered my soul, and the gathered power of my soul was moving so swiftly, it seemed to be at rest under cities of cloud, and under spheres of silver and changing worlds, until I saw a flash of trumpets above the battlements over time. Recorded by Cleve Gray, Tokyo, August 27th, 2006. Elijah Browning from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Eve Leaf www.rateyourwriting.com I was among multitudes of children dancing at the foot of a mountain. A breeze blew out of the east and swept them as leaves, driving some up the slopes. All was changed. Here were flying lights and mystic moons and dream music. A cloud fell upon us. When it lifted, all was changed. I was now amid multitudes who were wrangling. Then a figure in shimmering gold, and one with a trumpet, and one with a scepter stood before me. They mocked me, and danced a rigadoon, and vanished. All was changed again. Out of a bower of poppies a woman bared her breasts, and lifted her open mouth to mine. I kissed her. The taste of her lips was like salt. She left blood on my lips. I fell exhausted. I arose and ascended higher, but a mist as from an iceberg clouded my steps. I was cold and in pain. Then the sun streamed on me again, and I saw the mists below me hiding all below them, and I, bent over my staff, knew myself silhouetted against the snow, and above me was the soundless air pierced by a cone of ice over which hung a solitary star. A shudder of ecstasy, a shudder of fear ran through me, but I could not return to the slopes, nay, I wished not to return. For the spent waves of the symphony of freedom lapped the ethereal cliffs about me. Therefore I climbed to the pinnacle, I flung away my staff, I touched that star with my outstretched hand, I vanished utterly, for the mountain delivers to infinite truth Whosoever touches the star. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Number 244, Webster Ford, from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. Read for LibriVox.org by Sean McGahey. December 29, 2006. Do you remember, O Delphic Apollo, the sunset hour by the river when Mickey McGrew cried, There's a ghost! And I, it's Delphic Apollo. And the son of the banker derided us, saying, It's light by the flags at the water's edge, you half-witted fools. And from thence, as the wearisome years rolled on, long after poor Mickey fell down in the water tower to his death, down, down, through billowing darkness, I carried the vision which perished with him like a rocket which falls and quenches its light in earth, and hid it for fear of the son of the banker calling on Plutus to save me. Avenged were you for the shame of a fearful heart, 
who left me alone till I saw you again in an hour when I seemed to be turned to a tree with trunk and branches growing injurate, turning to stone, yet burgeoning in laurel leaves, in hosts of lambent laurel, quivering, fluttering, shrinking, fighting the numbness creeping into their veins from the dying trunk and branches. Tis vain, O youth, to fly the call of Apollo. Fling yourselves in the fire. Die with a song of spring, if die you must in the spring. For none shall look on the face of Apollo and live, and choose you must twixt death in the flame and death after years of sorrow, rooted fast in the earth, feeling the grisly hand, not so much in the trunk as in the terrible numbness creeping up to the laurel leaves that never cease to flourish until you fall. O leaves of me, too sear for corneal wreaths and fit alone for urns of memory, treasured perhaps as themes, for hearts heroic, fearless singers, and livers. Delphic Apollo End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Spooniad From Spoon River Anthology By Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org By Peter Yearsley the late Mr. Jonathan Swift Summers, laureate of Spoon River, planned the Spooniad as an epic in twenty-four books, but unfortunately did not live to complete even the first book. The fragment was found among his papers by William Marion Reedy, and was for the first time published in Reedy's Mirror of December the 18th, 1914 of John Cabanus's wrath and of the strife of hostile parties, and his dire defeat, who led the common people in the cause of freedom for Spoon River, and the fall of Rhodes Bank, that brought unnumbered woes and lost to many, with engendered hate that flamed into the torch in anarch hands to burn the courthouse, on whose blackened wreck a fairer temple rose and progress stood. Sing, muse! that lit the Kian's face with smiles, who saw the ant-like Greeks and Trojans crawl about Scamander, over walls, pursued or else pursuing, and the funeral pyres and sacred hecatombs, and first because of Helen, who with Paris fled to Troy as soulmate, and the wrath of Peleus's son decreed to lose Chryseis, lovely spoil of war, and dearest concubine. Say first, thou son of night, called Momus, from whose eyes no secret hides, and Thalia, smiling one, what bred twixt Thomas Rhodes and John Cabanis the deadly strife? His daughter Flossie, she, returning from her wandering with a troop of strolling players, walked the village streets, her bracelets tinkling and with sparkling rings, and words of serpent wisdom, and a smile of cunning in her eyes. Then Thomas Rhodes, who ruled the church, and ruled the bank as well, made known his disapproval of the maid, and all Spoon River whispered, and the eyes of all the church frowned on her, till she knew they feared her, and condemned but them to flout, she gave a dance to viols and to flutes, brought from Peoria, and many youths, but lately made regenerate through the prayers of zealous preachers and of earnest souls, danced merrily, and sought her in the dance who wore a dress so low of neck that eyes downstraying might survey the snowy swale till it was lost in whiteness. With the dance the village changed to merriment from gloom. The milliner, Mrs. Williams, could not fill her orders for new hats, and every seamstress plied busy needles making gowns. Old trunks and chests were opened for their store of laces, and rings and trinkets were brought out of hiding, and all the youths fastidious grew of dress. Notes passed, and many a fair one's door at eve knew a bouquet, and strolling lovers thronged about the hills that overlooked the river. 
Then, since the mercy seats more empty showed, one of God's chosen lifted up his voice. The woman of Babylon is among us. Rise, ye sons of light, and drive the wanton forth. So John Cabanis left the church, and left the hosts of law and order, with his eyes by anger cleared, and him the liberal cause acclaimed as nominee to the mayoralty, to vanquish A.D. blood. But as the war waged bitterly for votes, and rumours flew about the bank, and of the heavy loans which Rhodes's son had made to prop his loss in wheat, and many drew their coin and left the bank of Rhodes more hollow, with the talk among the liberals of another bank soon to be chartered. Lo, the bubble burst, mid cries and curses, but the liberals laughed, and in the hall of Nicholas Bindle held wise converse and inspiriting debate. High on a stage that overlooked the chairs where dozens sat, and where a pop-eyed daub of Shakespeare, very like the hired man of Christian Dolman, brow and pointed beard, upon a drab proscenium, outward stared, sat Harmon Whitney, to that eminence, by merit raised in ribaldry and guile. And to the assembled rebels thus he spake, Whether to lie supine and let a clique cold-blooded, scheming, hungry, singing psalms, devour our substance, wreck our banks, and drain our little hoards, for hazards on the price of wheat or pork, or yet to cower beneath the shadow of a spire, upreared to curb a breed of lackeys, and to serve the bank coadjutor in greed, that is the question. Shall we have music and the jocund dance, or tolling bells? Or shall young romance roam these hills about the river, flowering now to April's tears? Or shall they sit at home, or play croquet where Thomas Rhodes may see, I ask you. If the blood of youth runs o'er and riots gainst this regimen of gloom, shall we submit to have these youths and maids branded as libertines and wantons? Ere his words were done, a woman's voice called, No! Then rose a sound of moving chairs, as when the numerous swine o'errun the replenished troughs, and every head was turned, as when a flock of geese, back turning to the hunter's tread, rise up with flapping wings. Then rang the hall with riotous laughter, for with battered hat tilted upon her saucy head, and fist raised in defiance, Daisy Fraser stood. Headlong she had been hurled from out the hall, save Wendell Bloyd, who spoke for women's rights, prevented, and the bellowing voice of Burchard. Then, mid applause, she hastened toward the stage, and flung both gold and silver to the cause, and swiftly left the hall. Meantime, up stood a giant figure, bearded like the son of Alcmene, deep-chested, round of paunch, and spoke in thunder, over there behold a man who for the truth withstood his wife. Such is our spirit, when that A.D. blood compelled me to remove Dom Pedro. Quick, before Jim Brown could finish, Jefferson Howard obtained the floor and spake, Ill suits the time for clownish words, and trivial is our cause if naught's at stake but John Cabanus's wrath, he who was erstwhile of the other side, and came to us for vengeance, more's at stake than triumph for New England or Virginia, and whether rum be sold, or for two years, as in the past two years, this town be dry, matters but little. Oh, yes, revenue for sidewalks, sewers, that is well enough. I wish to God this fight were now inspired by other passion than to salve the pride of John Cabanis or his daughter. Why can a never contests of great moment spring from worthy things, not little? Still, 
if men must always act so, and if rum must be the symbol and the medium to release from life's denial and from slavery, then give me rum. Exultant cries arose. Then, as George Trimble had o'ercome his fear and vacillation, and began to speak, the door creaked, and the idiot Willie Metcalf, breathless and hatless, whiter than a sheet, entered and cried, "'The marshal's on his way to arrest you all, and if you only knew who's coming here to-morrow. I was listening beneath the window where the other side are making plans.' So, to a smaller room, to hear the idiot's secret, some withdrew, selected by the chair. The chair himself, and Jefferson Howard, Benjamin Pantier, and Wendell Bloyd, George Trimble, Adam Weirauch, Emmanuel Ehrenhard, Seth Compton, Godwin James, and Enoch Dunlap, Hiram Skates, Roy Butler, Carl Hamblin, Roger Heston, Ernest Hyde, and Pennywit, the artist, Kinsey Keene, and E. C. Culbertson, and Franklin Jones, Benjamin Fraser, son of Benjamin Pantier by Daisy Fraser, some of lesser note, and secretly conferred. But in the hall disorder reigned, and when the marshal came and found it so, he marched the hoodlums out, and locked them up. Meanwhile, within a room back in the basement of the church, with blood counselled the wisest heads. Judge Summers first, deep learned in life, and next him Elliot Hawkins and Lambert Hutchins, next him Thomas Rhodes and Editor Whedon, next him Garrison Standard, a traitor to the Liberals, who with lip upcurled in scorn and with a bitter sneer, such strife about an insult to a woman, a girl of eighteen. Christian Dolman, too, and others unrecorded, some there were who frowned not on the cup, but loathed the rule democracy achieved thereby, the freedom and lust of life it symbolized. Now morn with snowy fingers up the sky, flung like an orange at a festival the ruddy sun, when from their hasty beds poured forth the hostile forces, and the streets resounded to the rattle of the wheels that drove this way and that to gather in the tardy voters, and the cries of chieftains who manned the battle. But at ten o'clock the liberals bellowed fraud, and at the polls the rival candidates growled and came to blows. Then proved the idiot's tale of yester-eve a word of warning. Suddenly on the streets walked hog-eyed Allen, terror of the hills that looked on Bernadotte ten miles removed. No man of this degenerate day could lift the boulders which he threw, and when he spoke the windows rattled, and beneath his brows thatched like a shed with bristling hair of black, his small eyes glistened like a maddened boar, and as he walked the boards creaked, as he walked a song of menace rumbled. Thus he came, the champion of A.D. blood, commissioned to terrify the liberals. Many fled, as when a hawk soars o'er the chicken-yard. He passed the poles, and with a playful hand touched Brown the giant, and he fell against, as though he were a child, the wall. So strong was hog-eyed Allen. But the liberals smiled, for soon as hog-eyed Allen reached the walk, close on his steps paced Bengal Mike, brought in by Kinsey Keene, the subtle-witted one, to match the hog-eyed Allen. He was scarce three-fourths the other's bulk, but steel his arms and with a tiger's heart. Two men he killed and many wounded in the days before, and no one feared. But when the hog-eyed one saw Bengal Mike, his countenance grew dark. The bristles o'er his red eyes twitched with rage. The song he rumbled lowered. Round and round the courthouse paced he, followed stealthily by Bengal Mike, who jeered him every step. Come, elephant, and fight! Come, hog-eyed coward! 
Come, face about and fight me, lumbering sneak. Come, beefy bully, hit me if you can. Take out your gun, you duffer. Give me reason to draw and kill you. Take your billy out, I'll crack your boar's head with a piece of brick. But never a word the hog-eyed one returned, but trod about the courthouse, followed both by troops of boys and watched by all the men. All day they walked the square. But when Apollo stood with reluctant look above the hills, as fain to see the end, and all the votes were cast, and closed the polls, before the door of Trainer's drug store, Bengal Mike, in tones that echoed through the village, bawled the taunt, Who was your mother, hog-eyed? In a trice, as when a wild boar turns upon the hound that through the brakes upon an August day has, has gashed him with its teeth, the hog-eyed one rushed with his giant arms on Bengal Mike and grabbed him by the throat. Then rose to heaven the frightened cries of boys, and yells of men forth rushing to the street, and Bengal Mike moved this way and now that, drew in his head as if his neck to shorten, and bent down to break the death-grip of the hog-eyed one. Twixt guttural wrath and fast-expiring strength, striking his fists against the invulnerable chest of hog-eyed Allen. Then, when some came in to part them, others stayed them, and the fight spread among dozens, many valiant souls went down from clubs and bricks. But tell me, Muse, what god or goddess rescued Bengal Mike? With one last mighty struggle did he grasp the murderous hands, and turning, kick his foe, then, as if struck by lightning, vanished all the strength from hog-eyed Allen. At his side sank limp those giant arms, and o'er his face dread pallor and the sweat of anguish spread, and those great knees, invincible but late, shook to his weight, and quickly as the lion leaps on its wounded prey, did Bengal Mike smite with a rock the temple of his foe, and down he sank, and darkness o'er his eyes passed like a cloud. As when the woodman fells some giant oak upon a summer's day, and all the songsters of the forest shrill, and one great hawk that has his nestling young amid the topmost branches croaks as crash the leafy branches through the tangled boughs of brother oaks. So fell the hog-eyed one amid the lamentation of the friends of A.D. Blood. Just then four lusty men bore the town marshal on whose iron face the purple pall of death already lay, to Trainer's drug store, shot by Jack Maguire, and cries went up of Lynch him, and the sound of running feet from every side was heard bent on the End of Poem This recording is in the public domain. Epilogue From the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters The Graveyard of Spoon River Two voices are heard behind a screen decorated with diabolical and angelic figures in various allegorical relations. A faint light shows dimly through the screen as if it were woven of leaves, branches and shadows. First voice. A game of checkers. Second voice. Well, I don't mind. I move the will. You're playing it blind. Then here's the soul. Checked by the will. Eternal good. And eternal ill. I haste for the king row. Save your breath. I was moving life. You're checked by death. Very good. Here's Moses. And here's the Jew. My next move is Jesus. St. Paul for you. Yes, but St. Peter. 
You might have foreseen. You're in the king row. With Constantine. I'll go back to Athens. Well, here's the Persian. All right, the Bible. Pray now, what version? I take up Buddha. It never will work. From the corner, Mahomet. I move the Turk. The game is tangled. Where are we now? You're dreaming worlds. I'm in the king row. Move as you will. If I can't wreck you, I'll thwart you, harry you, rout you, check you. I'm tired. I'll send for my son to play. I think he can beat you finally. Eh? I must preside at the Stars Convention. Very well, my lord, but I beg to mention I'll give this game my direct attention. A game indeed. But truth is my quest. Beaten, you walk away with a jest. I strike the table, I scatter the checkers. A rattle of a falling table, and checkers flying over a floor. Aha, you armies and iron deckers, races and states in a cataclysm. Now, for a day of atheism. The screen vanishes, and Beelzebub steps forward, carrying a trumpet, which he blows faintly. Immediately, Loki and Yogarindra start up from the shadows of night. Beelzebub Good evening, Loki. Loki The same to you. And Yogarindra? Yogarindra My greetings, too. Whence came you, comrade? From yonder screen. And what were you doing? Stirring his spleen. How did you do it? I made it rough in a game of checkers. Good enough. I thought I heard the sounds of battle. No doubt I made the checkers rattle turning the table over and strewing the bits of wood like an army pursuing. I have a game. Let us make a man. My net is waiting him if you can. And here's my mirror to fool him with. Mystery, falsehood, creed, and myth. But no one can mould him, friend, but you. Then to the sport, without more ado. Hurry the work ere it grow today. I set me to it. Where is the clay? He scrapes the earth with his hands and begins to model. Out of the dust, out of the slime, a little rust and a little lime, muscle and gristle, mucin stone, braid with a pestle, fat and bone, out of the marshes, out of the vaults, matter crushes gas and salts. What is this you call a mind? Flitting, drifting, pale and blind, soul of the swamp that rides the wind. jack here you are. Dream of heaven, pine for a star, Chase your brothers to and fro. Back to the swamp at last you'll go. Hilloo, hilloo. The valley. Hilloo, hilloo. hilloo. Beelzebub, in scraping up the earth, turns out a skull. Old one, old one, now ere I break you, crush you and make you clay for my use let me observe you you were a bold one flat at the dome of you heavy the base of you false to the home of you 
Strong was the face of you, strange to all fears. Yet did the hair of you hide what you were, now to re-nerve you. He crushes the skull between his hands and mixes it with a clay. Now you are dust, limestone and rust. I mould and I stir and make you again. Again? 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 In the same manner, Beelzebub has fashioned several figures, standing them against the trees. Now for the breath of life. As I remember, you had done right to mould your creatures first, and stand them up. From gravitation I make the will. Out of sensation comes his ill. Out of my mirror springs his error. Who was so cruel to make him the slave of me, the sorceress, you the knave, and you the plotter to catch his thought? Whatever he did, whatever he sought, with a nature dual of will and mind, a thing that sees and a thing that's blind. Come to our dance. Something hated him made us over him, therefore faded him. They join hands and dance. Passion, reason, custom, rules, creeds of the church, lore of the schools, taint in the blood and strength of soul, flesh too weak for the will's control, poverty, riches, pride of birth, wailing laughter over the earth. Here I have you caught again. Enter my web, ye sons of men. Look in my mirror. Isn't it real? What do you think now? What do you feel? Here is treasure of gold heaped up. Here is wine in the festal cup. Tendrils blossoming, turned to whips. Love with her breasts and scarlet lips breathe in their nostrils. Falsehood's breath out of nothingness into death. Out of the mould, out of the rocks, wonder, mockery, paradox. Soaring spirit, groveling flesh, bait the trap and spread the mesh. Give him hunger, lure him with truth, give him the iris hopes of youth. Starve him, shame him, fling him down, whirled in the vortex of the town. Break him, age him, till he Curse the idiot face of the universe. Over and over we mix the clay. What was dust is alive today. Thus is the hell-born tangle wound, swiftly, 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 round and round. Waving his trumpet. You live away. How strange and new! I am I, and another too. I was a son's dew's leaf, but now what is this longing? Earth below, I was a seedling, magnet tipped, drawn down earth. And I was gripped electrons in a granite stone. Now, I think. Oh, how alone. My lips to thine. Through thee I find something alone by love divined. Be gone. No, wait. I have bethought me, friends. Let's give a play. He waves his trumpet. To yonder green rooms go. The figures disappear. Oh, yes, a play. That's very well, I think. But who will be the audience? I must throw illusion over all. And I must shift the scenery and tangle up the plot. Well, so you shall. Our audience shall come from yonder graves. He blows his trumpet slightly louder than before. The scene changes. 
a stage arises among the graves. The curtain is down, concealing the creatures just created, illuminated halfway up by spectral lights. Beelzebub stands before the curtain. A terrific blast of the trumpet. Foo -foo. Immediately there is a rustling as of the shelves of grasshoppers stirred by a wind, and hundreds of the dead, including those who have appeared in the anthology, hurry to the sound of the trumpet. A voice. Gabriel! Gabriel! Many voices. The, the Judgment, judgment day. day. Be quiet, if you please, at least until the stars fall and the moon. Save, Save us! us. Save, Save us! us. Beelzebub extends his hands over the audience with a benedictory motion and restores order. Ladies and gentlemen, your kind attention to my interpretation of the scene. I rise to give your fancy comprehension and analyze the parts of the machine. My mood is such that I would not deceive you, though still a liar and the father of it. From judgment's frailty I would retrieve you, though falsehood is my art and though I love it. Down in the habitations whence I rise, the roots of human sorrow boundless spread. Long have I watched them draw the strength that lies in clay made richer by the rotting dead. Here is a blossom, here a twisted stalk, here fruit that sourly withers ere its prime, and here a growth that sprawls across the walk, food for the green worm which it turns to slime. The ruddy apple with a core of cork springs from a root which in a hollow dangles. Not skilful husbandry nor laborious work can save the tree which lightning breaks and tangles. Why does the bright nasturtium scarcely flower but that those insects multiply and grow, which make it food? and in the very hour in which the veined leaves and blossoms blow. Why does a goodly tree, while fast maturing, turn crooked branches covered o'er with scale? Why does the tree whose youth was not assuring prosper and bear while all its fellows fail? I, under earth, see much. I know the soil, I know where mould is heavy and where thin, I see the stones that thwart the ploughman's toil, the crooked roots of what the priests call sin, I know all secrets even to the core, what seedlings will be upas, pine, and laurel. It cannot change howe'er the fields worked o'er, man's what he is, and that's the devil's moral. So with the souls of the ensuing drama, they sprang from certain seed in certain earth. Behold them in the devil's cyclorama, shown in their proper light for all their worth. Now to my task, I'll give an exhibition of mixing the ingredients of spirit. He waves his wand. Come, crucible, perform your magic mission. Come, recreative fire, and hover near it. I'll make a soul, or show how one is made. He waves his wand again. Party-coloured flames appear. This is the woman you shall see anon. A red flame appears. This hectic flame makes all the world afraid. It was a soldier's scourge which ate the bone. 
His daughter bore the lady of the action and died at thirty-nine of scrofula. She was a creature of a sweet attraction, whose sex obsession no one ever saw. A purple flame appears. Lo, this denotes aristocratic strains back in the centuries of France's glory. A blue flame appears. And this, the will that pulls against the chains her father strove until his hair was hoary. Sorrow and failure made his nature cold. He never loved the child whose woe is shown, and hence her passion for the things which gold brings in this world of pride and brings alone. The human heart that's famished from its birth turns to the grosser treasures that is plain. Thus aspiration fallen fills the earth with jungle growths of bitterness and pain. Of Celtic Gallic fire, our heroine, courageous, cruel, passionate, and proud, false, vengeful, cunning, without fear of sin, a head that oft is bloody but not bowed. Now, if she met a man, Suppose our hero, with whom her chemistry shall war yet mix, as if she were her borgia to his Nero, twill look like one of Satan's little tricks. However, it must be, the world's great garden is not all mine, I only sow the tares. Wheat should be made immune, or else the warden should stop their coming in the world's affairs. But to our hero, long ere he was born, I knew what would repel him and attract. Such spirit mathematics, fig or thorn, I can prognosticate before the act. A yellow flame appears. This is a grandsire's treason in an orchard against a maid whose nature with his mated. Lurid flames appear. And this his memory, distrait and tortured, which marked the child with hate because she hated. Our heroine's grand dame was that maid's own cousin, but never this our man and woman knew. The child in time of lovers had a dozen, then wed a gentleman upright and true. And thus our hero had a double nature. One half of him was bad, the other good. The devil must exhaust his nomenclature and make this puzzle rightly understood. But when our hero and our heroine met, they were at once attracted. The repulsion was hidden under passion with her net, which must enmesh you ere you feel revulsion. The virus coursing in the soldier's blood, the orchard's ghost, the unknown kinship twixt them. Our hero's mother's lovers round them stood, shadows that smiled to see how fate had fixed them. This twain pledge vows and marry, that's the play. And then the tragic features rise and deepen, he is a tender husband, when away the serpents from the orchard slyly creep in, our heroine, born of spirit none too loyal, picks fruit of knowledge, leaves the tree of life. Her fancy turns to France corrupt and royal, soon she forgets her duty as a wife. You know the rest, so far as that's concerned, 
she met exposure and her husband slew her he lost his reason for the love she spurned he prized her as his own how slight he knew her he waves a wand showing a man in a prison cell now here he sits condemned to mount the gallows he could not tell his story he is dumb love says your poets is a grace that hallows i call it suffering and martyrdom the judge with pointed fingers says you killed her well so he did and here's the explanation he could not give it i the drama builder show you the various truths and their relation he waves his wand now to begin the curtain is ascending they meet at tea upon a flowery lawn fair is it not how sweet their souls are blending the author calls the play laocoon only an earth dream with which we are done a flash of a comet upon the earth stream a dream twice removed a spectral confusion of earth's dread illusion these are the ghosts from the desolate coast will you go to them only pursue them whatever enshrined is within you is you in a place where no wind is out of the damp be ye as lamps flame like a spire to me alone true the life in the fire beelzebub loki and yogarindra vanish the phantasmagoria fades out where the dead seemed to have assembled only heaps of leaves appear there is the light as of dawn voices of spring the springtime is come the winter departed she wakens from slumber and dances light-hearted the sun is returning we are done with alarms earth lifts her face burning held close in his arms the sun is an eagle who broods o'er his young the earth is his nursling in whom he has flung the life flame in seed in blossom desire till fire become life and life become fire I slip and I vanish, I baffle your eye. I dive and I climb, I change and I fly. You have me, you lose me, who have me too well. Now find me and use me, I am here in a cell. You're there in a the cell? Oh, now for raw, with which to divine you. Nay, child, I am God. When the waking waters rise from their beds of snow under the hill, In little rooms of stone where they sleep when icicles rain, The April breezes scurry through woodland saying, Fulfill, awaken roots under cover of soil, it is spring again. Then the sun exults, the moon is at peace, and voices Call to the silver shadows to lift the flowers from their dreams, And a longing, longing enters my heart of sorrow, my heart that rejoices in the fleeting glimpse of a shining face and her hair that gleams i arise and follow alone for hours the winding way by the river hunting a vanishing light and a solace for joy too deep where do you lead me wild one on and on forever over the hill over the hill and down to the meadows of sleep the sun over the soundless depths of space for a hundred million miles speeds the soul of me. Silent thunder struck from a harp of fire. Before my eyes the planets wheel and a universe defiles. I but a luminant speck of dust upborne in a vast desire. What is my universe that obeys me? 
myself compelled to obey a power that holds me and whirls me over a path that has no end. And there are my children who call me great, the giver of life and day. Myself a child who cry for life and know not whither I tend. A million, million suns above me, as if the curtain of night were hung before creation's flame that shone through the weave of the cloth, each with its worlds and worlds and worlds crying upward for light, for each is drawn in its course to what? As the candle draws the moth. The Milky Way Orbits unending Life never-ending, power without end. Wouldst thou be Lord, not peace but a sword, not heart's desire, ever aspire. Worship thy power, conquer thy hour, sleep not but strive, so shalt thou live. Infinite Depths Infinite Law Infinite Life End of Epilogue and End of Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters This recording is in the public domain.